Marion Waldman with Teach My Kid to Read. And today we are going to give you the confidence to use the Hornet Literacy Primer with confidence. And I came to this world as a parent, as did Abby Tovel, who is uh, the other person in, in, in the black shirt here. And we're going to be asking Nicola Cook and Marie Cowling of the Hornet Literacy Primer and Faith Berkowski of High Five Literacy questions about how to use this book so it's very clear how you could start helping a child learn to read. So the first question that I have is, well, how does this book really help my child? Well, I think, I mean, obviously we've got the two books, The Hornet and The Word Wars. So we, first of all, I would recommend doing the suitability test to help you decide whether The Hornet is a suitable test or The Wasp. And basically, the beauty of this book is everything is contained within there. So I know you're probably thinking, I don't know where to start, but basically you start the first page and that will teach you from the basic sounds. The instructions are always on the left-hand page, the exercises are on the right, and you just slowly move through. Try not to be too daunted with the instructions and just, just take it step by step and it will slowly but surely you will start to see the improvements and also you'll start to see the weaknesses. Lots of dots in certain areas are there to show you that they, they've not picked up on what's going on here. It's not just tick, 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 dot, dot, dot. It's showing you, oh, they're, they're competent there, they're not here. And that's what the, the dating and the dotting and the ticking is. And it's just step by step, just move from one place to the next, to the next. And we're just slowly building, because we know that we're struggling, readers and spellers need the information drip feeding. It's not just a book of rules and give a child a rule and expect them to memory it. We're doing it slowly. And all the exercises are entwined. So they learn one rule, they're brought in and on a next page. And that's why it's, you can't skip exercises because they're so entwined. If you start jumping about, you're going to just miss little bits because it's discreetly teaching a child to basically to think, this, you know, the processing skills. So it's just slowly building step by step. And, yeah. I'm going to jump in first. Yeah. So, um, Nicola, you mentioned ticks and dots, and we didn't really establish what that means in your program. So right. just to jump in, there is a record keeping component in these books and a parent will see a grid. And as they move through the exercises, a, a tick is equivalent to what we would call a check. Ah, so okay, yeah. so yeah. this yeah. is American translation. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you make a little tick, it's correct. It's yeah. just a slash meaning correct. It's like what we would call a check. Yeah. A dot means that it's incorrect. We would mm -hmm. usually make an X to show incorrect, but the dot is a gentle way of showing that yeah. there's a mistake and the idea is to reveal where, as you said, the strengths are. They should be getting ticks or checks mm -hmm. in each particular skill. And um, there is repetition of this. So you don't just do it once. You're going back to make sure it wasn't a fluke that the child actually has the skill in long-term memory. We don't want to patronize, but at the same time, we don't want to obviously say, oh, you've got a cross, it's, you've got that wrong. So we, I always say to my students, oh, we need practice with that. Oh, that's a way we need to bit of practice. So it's getting them used to, it's not that they've got it, well, they have got it wrong, but we don't want to put them off. We don't want to knock the confidence. And I always say to my students, if you're getting lots of dots, that's my problem. I've not explained it well enough to you. So it's all about building their esteem. Some of these children have gone through exercise after exercise with different programs. And a lot of the times they're at absolute rock bottom at the time they come to us. And this is going to be an emotional roller coaster for parents and for students, you know, because it's, it is, you know, sometimes you have to say, right, we're going to have a break here because it's just got a bit too much. But yeah, it's just a slow. And you get two checks in a row. And we do, because it is two rather than three, like in toe by toe, because we go two for spelling, two for reading. So in effect, it's four checks, but we do two on the reading side and two on the spelling. 
The okay. spelling for us really helps to identify when, you, you know, if somebody can spell sounds, spell words, you know they've got a really good grasp of it. Sometimes reading's a lot easier and that's why we do the spelling as well. We okay. learn to read okay. through spelling as far as we're concerned as well. So to stop also, because we're assuming that no one has seen this, you know, let, so if um, parents, if you're looking at this book, realize um, when Nicola mentions two for reading, two for spelling, what she's referring to is each skill is taught for one receptive understanding, reading and seeing if they could read through it. That's a blending skill to be able to read through a word. And then the same skill is really being assessed to see if they could take a word that they hear and break it into sounds and write it down, which is the spelling piece. They need to do each one of these pieces correct, correctly, uh, doing it twice, so that this way parents could feel comfortable moving on to the next skill. So it's there's a building of skills here along the way. That's the record keeping component. Yeah, but it's on different days, so we would we do. You know, so I would say, I would say we, we're sort of two steps forward, one step back, because as soon as you start your next session, you're revisiting the, the sections that have got not two checks, okay. then you're moving on. Then the next session, you're going back again. Let's see where there's not two checks. And then we're moving on. So you're slowly but surely moving on bit by bit. And like I said before, some areas will take lots of practice. And you might think oh, I've been working on this page for weeks now. But they've obviously got a you know, big problem with that. Some sections you'll find, oh, we're fine with that, really confident with that, we can move on. So it's just, yeah. and that's why it's one book per student because we know everybody works at their own pace. Everybody deserves their own. This is like their own record of achievement in the end by the end of it. We don't want to be sitting down with three because they all, sit, they all move at different paces, don't we? We just want to give them their own. What, 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 what we are teaching, we're teaching a code here. We want our students to understand that our language is a two-way code. We pull apart the words to spell and we build them back together to read. It's, yeah, if, I want our students to understand if they, if they could read a message, then they, they should be able to write one back. It is a two-way code. That's why it's reading and spelling. There's lots of research out there now saying that reading, reading and spelling done in tandem is in this systematic structured program is key you know to do complement one another as Nicola says once you know your student can spell those sounds you know you know you're going to know they can read them they complement one another and as I say it's a two-way code it is a two-way code all Orton Gillingham programs work that way so any parent who has been exposed to um you know the science of reading uh, yeah. They, you know, they look for Orton Gillingham or they look for any type of evidence based program. Uh, your program is in line with what we know is best practice to teach it as um, a code where kids could read, they could spell. Yeah. yeah. Um, could I ask, uh, does everyone start at the same place? Yeah, definitely. They definitely need to start at the beginning of the language. I even adults start at the beginning of the beginning of the language, because I, as I said before, I get students coming in and they don't want to start at the beginning of the language. They think they are, you know, I'm not doing those baby sounds. My answer is, well, if you know them, just let's just let's make sure you know them. And if they do know them, you know, they'll move through that exercise really quick. And for younger, for younger children, it does give them confidence. You know, they might know him, but it gives them confidence to start the program. They think, oh, yeah, I can do this. And it's a good, good start. I'm never surprised that some students, even, even adults, they'll start doing the sounds. And then they'll, when we come to queer, they'll say Q. When we come to the fur, they'll say fur. B's and D's have a mix up. And C's and G's have a mix up. So... Yeah, everyone has to start at the beginning. It's a slow progress. We start at the beginning of the language. We make sure that they've got these sounds cemented before we move on. Yeah, and I, as I said before, you know, you can never presume anything about a student's early development. That's that's I have that in my mind all the time. Never presume anything. Let's just double check 
because you are going to do them a disservice if you don't get them foundation skills right. So mm -hmm. that's all I can say. How long and often should I do this with my child? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. It depends on their age, really. I would definitely, well, ideally it'd be every day, but we know they're not going to do every day. I would say at least three times a week, 15 to 20 minutes. Obviously, if you've, obviously if you've got a student that can work longer, I'd do longer. Yeah. But some are actually, you know, some students can be exhausted after 15 minutes. Yeah. Play it by ear, really. Yeah. You can always tell those students that put in the extra practice and they will get through it quicker. And that's all I can say to anybody, you know, if you're only going to do it twice a week, it's going to take you longer. The repetition is key. If you can do it daily, even 10 minutes a day, just pick it up, just do a little bit. That will help you get it through it faster. So it's, okay. it will work if you only do it twice a week, but it's going to take you longer. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And what, what would you recommend? Do you have any tips for if your child is really especially again, like a teenager who thinks this is babyish, I don't need this. If they're really reluctant to try it, do you have any tips for how to overcome that? Well, I just always start saying, I mean, try not to patronize and just have lots of patience and understand why they are so frustrated. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure if I was 15 and I'd gone through so many interventions at school and so, you know, your initial thought is, oh, here we go again. Yeah, I, I what's just, so good about your program? I'm just never going to be able to do it. I just don't see why I need to read. Why do I need to spell? And you just got to take it right back and just try and explain, you know, try and see it from their side. You know, it is frustrating. Anything difficult, nobody wants to do. Let's face it, I hate doing things that I don't want to do. So it's just understanding that. Build up a bit of confidence. Your first few sessions, you're not going to do, you're not going to get through loads of this because it's about building confidence and helping them realize I can do this. Once they start realizing that they're doing it, they don't need any more encouragement because they know I'm doing this and it's working. That's the, the best thing for them is to see that it's actually working. Yeah. And so, there's logic to what you're doing with them. Yeah. yeah it's brilliant. That's for older students, for only young students. To be honest, it's treats, treats, yeah. treats, bribery, bribery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. stickers, which stickers do you want to choose when we get to certain pages? But obviously, you're not going to do this like Nicholas said with older students. To be honest, like Nicholas says, when you've got an older student, yeah, they are a bit cocky with you, you know, and they want to know, hmm, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. But as Nicholas says, once they start to go through the programme and they get their confidence, like, is that it? I can actually that, do that. I had a student the other is. day and we were spelling um, deny. And I went, is that it? And defy. It, it just couldn't believe that it would fall. If I'd be a right long word, it'd be a right <laughs> people, yeah, long word. Just, but once you start realising, and you'll see, you'll see they'll go, have I got that right? Yeah. I've really got that right. You know, and that's, but you've got to get through those barriers. Yeah. But it's once you get that light bulb going. Yeah. You're aware with, with, with yeah. But you have got to understand with all the students why they are frustrated. So I'm just going to mention to parents, um, as far as doing the work, because um, I'm really a taskmaster, you know, when it comes to this, um, they, they have to do the practice. Uh, what I say to parents is, you have to think what you give your kids normally on a daily basis. If you're handing your kid an iPad um, all the time, a computer all the time, these video games all the time, well, they're used to filling their day with what they want. You have to turn this around and put it on your terms. No, you earn those things. So you do this with me first and you earn your time on a video game. You earn your time on an iPad or TV time or whatever it is. And then it becomes, that's the reward. They're used to getting things daily as a natural occurrence. But if we turn it around and say, well, today, let's see if you earn that time. We mm -hmm. do this, then you could go and guess what? You don't have to shell out a ton of money on gifts. You have to just take the time to set the parameters in your house. 
I don't care how old a kid is, you, it's still your house. So, you know, I think, and maybe this is my old fashioned ways, but you know, the parents are the parents. And you know, it, if you have to earn the time to do the things you want to do, we have work to do now, we get that done and then we do it. So I hear this a lot from parents and that's why I'm jumping in. Oh, I can't work with my own child. I just can't work with my own child. Well, if you can't get that established, it's gonna be a lot harder when they really get older. You know, <laughs> you know it, 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 there are things you gotta start establishing like this, the ground rules, this is how we do it. So I'm just putting that out there that the kid is going to balk looking at this book and the parents are going to balk because that is just typical. And the kids feed off of the parents. You know, that's, you know, you see that the parents get nervous, they get flustered, the kid doesn't want to do it. They give up before they even start. Mm -hmm. The parents have to take time and build that base and say, I can do this, but first I need to think about a time frame. When are we going to do this? Oh, it's going to be mornings before school. It's going to be after school. It's going to be whatever it is. Establish that steady routine and how this has to come before anything else. And then you earn those types of things that they normally get on a daily basis. So that's my mom hat too. Yeah, it's very, it's very helpful. And so a question that I have is, uh, uh, what if my child really doesn't know any of the sounds? Can they still use this program? Well, the starting, the sounds are the starting block, aren't yeah. they really? If your child doesn't know any sounds, then you need to to drop everything that you're doing and work on them sounds. Whether mm -hmm. you use flashcards, writing in time, anything, mm -hmm. the sounds are absolutely vital to the building blocks, aren't they? they yeah, this them. program could cope with not knowing a few sounds, but if they don't know the sounds at all, no, I wouldn't start it. You need, you to, need have, to have, you know, some, some sounds established mm -hmm. there because you, you're going to be doing it forever. It yeah. works on this, sounds. This it? book is really to make sure, to, before you start the program, to make sure they do know the sounds. As I say, mm -hmm. it can cope with a few sounds that they don't know. But no, I wouldn't start it if, if they don't know any of the sounds at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you, how are parents um, supposed to know this? Well, in terms of, like, let's say the kid starts. I'm throwing yeah. this out there. Yeah. And, I mean, as a person who's a professional, I would know what to do, obviously. But yeah. I'm just saying a parent gets this book. Uh, many of them are really not sure of the sounds themselves. Well, they need, they need, I mean, there's lots on the internet now. I would just put in the sounds, you know, letter to sounds. And by sounds, we don't mean letter names. We don't mean A to Z, we mean a book. So they need to really understand what those sounds are. I mean, in the first pages, there's a grid that gives you an example of what the sounds are. Um, so there's little pictures. And so that helps you as a parent know what we're talking about when we mean these sounds. But yeah, they do need to know them. The sounds are absolutely right. Well, you just have to practice, practice with this grid. But I, I, I know a lot of people don't like flashcards. I don't think there's anything wrong, wrong with flashcards at this mm -hmm. stage, at stage. It's quite acceptable, you know, to teach them to do with flashcards, just sounds only. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we are also in a partnership with a program called Itchy's Alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with Itchy's Alphabet, she, as a teacher, a special ed teacher, Brenda Larson, realized for some kids it, it's hard to associate letter and sound. She, like you and like us, believed that the sound is the right place to start rather than alphabet letter names. Mm -hmm. And she has these um, picture mnemonics to help kids to remember the sound. So that might be a good compliment yes. for those parents who need that type of help because yes. just flashing a conventional letter for some kids might not do it. 
to be oh, honest. Yeah, they, do, they need to the picture. You need to do whatever them. you can for the sounds, don't you? I mean, practice writing them, practice, you know, seeing them, doing it in sound, whatever you feel that that's going to help them, them sounds. You, they're never going to move on unless they know the sounds at the end of the mm -hmm. day. So you're not getting around it. Yeah. So um, how come we say the sound instead of the letter? Uh, well, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of students that do know the letter names and they don't know the letter sounds, which I don't think letter names at this stage of the, of the program would be helpful at all. I've had students come in, and as soon as if I wrote a capital R, I think it says R on its own, and they tell them no, it can't just because it's a capital doesn't mean to say it can say A or D. Yeah. And I do say to them, right, we're going to write, we're going to spell some sounds. And as soon as I say M, right, capital N, or I'll say uh, A, and I'd still say to them, look, no, that, you can't do that. I want this sound, but they will write capital N. So I just think the names that very early on don't help at all. In fact, I had, I had a grown up that would spell L, and he just put capital yeah. L and a P, <laughs> help. And it's, it, you know, it's just not helpful at all. At all. So, so you know, there's some some parents <clears throat> drill the children with the A to Z in the alphabet, and they're doing it in a well-meaning way. They're thinking, oh, this is giving my child a foot, you know, a la step up the ladder. They're going to school and they know their A to Z, and but then you've got to sort of unpick that and then say, well, yeah, now we're going to talk about the sounds of it. So in my head, I'm thinking, forget the names at this stage. The the, the building block is the sounds. You know, that's the building blocks of our language. So why would you not do that first? They're not going to get anywhere by knowing names alone at this stage. Well, you can't build with names, can you, at all? No. So, but it's so very anti-American. You know that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so <laughs> so um, in this country, I just, again, in the UK, that's very common to start with the sounds. Right. Uh, and parents are not drilling the alphabet early, many of them, I, I, from what I hear, at least on social media, that um, they are not really, you know, doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G early on, that they know that when kids start formal schooling, that they're going to be taught when they see a letter that they're going to say A mm -hmm. in, instead of A. So it's a very different mindset here. And Abby, in answer to your question, if you just think common sense, if I said to you C-A-T, would you be able to read that word? But if I said to you C-A-T, would that help you? Right, right. So It's almost it, telling you what, what it's saying, isn't it, when you yeah. use sounds? Yes, so yeah. it's just, if you step it back and you just, think logically what's needed here. What's needed mm -hmm. would be to understand that the letters are a code for sounds. The letter mm -hmm. names is a label that might help us with filing, <laughs> you know, yeah. filing yeah. papers um, and some other things, you know, alphabetical order. I open a phone book and I know, oh, the middle of the phone book is right about here, LM, you know, but um, the sounds, are really what help us. But this is a very different mindset in this country, just letting you know that right. um, this whole speech to print, sound to letter is a very different way of thinking. I think that's probably like the UK. I mean, when you first started with Toe by Toe, you used to go to some trade shows and things and people would just be like, oh, oh phon phonics was a dirty word. It was oh, not that barking at print again, and it was all it was it was really awful. You know, twenty five years ago, it wasn't accepted here at all. I think we've moved on quite a lot, especially with the phonics check um, being you know mandatory now in, from the Department for Education. That was a massive leap for for the UK. Yeah. So maybe that's what they need in America. I don't I suppose you have the phonics check over there then? No. So we um, every state functions differently here. <laughs> so um, it's, and it's a large country. Mm. So, uh, you know, you, it's nice that you have a phonics check and for parents, what that means is they have a pseudo word, nonsense word assessment 
that basically shows that the kid could push the sounds together and read a word that's not real. Um, because if they could do that, then it's showing they can decode and, mm -hmm. and be able to read a word. So we have assessments like that here. We have an assessment called Dibbles um, and so one of the indicators on the Dibbles assessment is nonsense word fluency, which is right. like a phonics check, but people look at it, they use it, they don't use it. Then they go back into cueing the kids with pictures. It's a mess. <laughs> so yeah. it's, right. it's, it's a free for all. Yeah, right. it, it is a mess here if a, if a child's not kept up to the classroom with this um, system because once, if a child's not keeping up they usually get passed on to get the help from um, an on to learning assistant and parents volunteers help and they they then get what we call a balanced approach so we'll get a small amount of phonics um, look and say mnemonics it, it is a mixed bag and yeah. we know this is really bad practice I mean they're doing it because they really think they're helping these um, children but that's where these books can really come in now at schools if a child it can't keep up to the classroom approach they're passed on to an LSA with our book which is fantastic for us yeah. and they can see you know, it really highlights the weakness, weaknesses where these students have struggled anyhow they don't need a balanced approach they can do it they've just missed out a little bit not everybody can work you know to a classroom method together exactly. so. so they have to write the words or parts of words for spelling what if the child has trouble writing are there alternatives well yeah well it obviously it's really going to roll the program up if they're really struggling with writing you might get half a column done because they're really struggling with writing I don't think there's anything up with uh, letter tiles I don't think there's anything up with an older one using the keyboard but I'm not saying forget about handwriting when I'm saying this what I use do mine if they're really struggling with the writing they use the letter tiles but then for homework they've got to write these out they've got to really practice with their hand, handwriting always oh I do exactly the same I think there's lots of research out there now that says physically handwriting saying the sounds out loud it activates the reading circuits in your brain. So it's not only helping your handwriting spell, it's helping your reading. So, you know, we have lots, of, especially older ones, what do I need to write for? We've got computers, we've got telephone, you know, I don't need to write anymore. They're not realising the, the actual, the activities Process. that goes on in the brain when you're physically writing down. So although sometimes during the lesson, we've only got 40 minutes, I'll say use your keyboard. But afterwards, when you're not pressured for time, you need to go practice the handwriting because... Like I say, it's doing more than just making you be able to write and pay for it. Writing, read it, you know, sight, everything's all tied together. So where are they, where do you recommend they get the handwriting? So in oh. other words, if let's say, because I work with a lot of kids and I do it at the same time. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are programs that do not address handwriting. This is kind of why I, I bridge things together because mm -hmm. I feel it rewires the brain to work. Yeah, on it, like, yeah. and I think people brain. don't understand that. Yeah. It's just that sometimes we've got older students and we might have 20 minutes with them. Yeah. And 20, if we've only got 20 minutes and they're only gonna get like four, they've only wrote four words. You're not really getting, you know, you want them to learn to read, you want them to learn to spell and that does hold them back. That's what. That's why I let them use the, the keyboard. Because okay, let's do this. But I do. I'm just saying I do make them practice these words. To me, it's just like anything else. It's practice, practice, practice. Yeah, you can't say that enough. Don't no. ever give up on handwriting. No. And I think, like I said, there is a lot more. I keep seeing a lot of articles now that are coming out, and a lot, you know, a lot of research that's coming out that explains about what it does in the brain when you're actually writing, and it's really interesting. It is really interesting. And we do have we do have a lot of good handwriting programs yeah, over here now. There is. I mean, I can't say that I would recommend it anyone in particular. I don't know if you know any faith that are really good yeah. programs to use. Well, I mentioned Itchy's Alphabet before. Right. And yeah. uh, what and again, you know, I'm not taking away, for, I, you know, I don't want to take away time from what we're doing here, but no, there not. is value in kind of piecing it together. And I think that it teach my kid to read. I'm plugging what we're doing, to be honest, is saying, 
no, we're not endorsing a program, but we see value in lots of different programs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I'm on social media, I am like pumping up a lot of different things I see because mm -hmm. I don't believe that there is this one magic pill for everything. No. Um, and of course it all depends on how it's implemented. But I do think that Brenda's Itchy's Alphabet program not only helps with letter recognition, there's a handwriting piece with letter formation. And so we kind of recommended that as our initial stage in building letter sound knowledge, along with decodable books and using a program like yours for the parent who um, wants to do it himself or herself and feels that they could just pick something up and get started. But we wanna let parents know there are these prerequisites that mm -hmm. are important. It, and that's what could overwhelm somebody that, you know, well, my kid forms his letters backwards and bottom up and all this kind of stuff. How do I do it all? Where do I begin? My kid doesn't know the sounds. You know, he, when he sees a Y, he's saying, you know, when he sees a U, you know, he's saying, you, you know, all this kind of stuff because they've been with letter names for so long. Yeah. So there, there needs to be this understanding that there is a progression and that your program certainly is commendable and it works, but it's, it, we need to kind of fill in the pieces here and make suggestions for those parents oh, who need it. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, I talk about that in my books, you know, um, as an author, you know, I, I, you know, the, if only I would have known book that, you know, Marion has made a part of Teach My Kid to Read tells parents from the beginning, basically what those components look like, why it's important. And then it's also, I think you read Failing Students or Failing Schools. I talk about handwriting. There's a whole chapter dedicated to the importance of handwriting. So um, I'm with you and everything you're saying, the sounds first, the handwriting, we just need to make this clear to a person who's not trained in education, and is a little fearful to start that these are the pieces that are important. Uh, I was wondering if we could walk through a couple of the exercises together. Yeah, just to sure. see what they're like. Um, Here's something I think would be a good idea. And just, um, Abby, I'm, I'm going to jump in because I, I, think, I, I think you should pick something that makes your program unique. And what makes it unique is how, when the word is said, the child has to just write a vowel sound. Right, okay. Okay, yeah. that's a little different from some of the other programs. Right. And so why they are writing just the vowel sound is to be able to have a kid think about what that vowel sound is. It isolates yeah. it. Can that child show phonemic awareness mm -hmm. by hearing a word, isolating the vowel sound and writing it down. Why don't you choose that? Because that's a little different. Yeah, yeah. and that is one that a lot of people say, what's the point in this? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, is, so. and that is I get it, but yeah, that is the whole them. point of it. We, we want them to be able to hear the words and they're the picking out the vowels, so they're isolating it and saying it. And in the hornet, we start with just vowel sounds, don't we? So we'd say, can you, if I said the word fad, you'd want your student just to go, ah and say sound because they're up there you know acknowledging that ah is making it sound and then you know for instance you say bud and you want them to go oh sound and you move on so they're you you're wanting them to notice the vowels and this really helps them when later on because you probably all have them students that they look at the word fad and go fed bud fed you know but so you're really wanting them to pay, pay attention to these vowel sounds that they can hear in them and then it does bring in names and then later on, the whole, the wasp deals with vowel sounds and names first of all. The vowel names, when they come in, it is quite, 
you'll find some students really struggle with this. So if I said born, you'd want them to go or oh, name. Then I might say um, spike, I, name. But then I'd say gift and they'd go it, it, sound. So you really want them to really concentrate really and work name. out. They're listening, I can hear its name. It's an I, it's an I, it's a cause they're really acknowledging that what the vowels are doing in these words before they come to even spelling them, we want them to be able to hear and tell us the difference that they can hear a vowel sound. And I had one student yesterday who found this so tricky. It, it's almost like it was, you could see the wheels in his brain, like, you know, it's like, I'd say sad and you're going, ah, ah, name, oh, no, sad, ah, you know, and it's like, it's, it's really good for cognitive processing skills that they have to really think about what can I hear is it a sound? Is it a name? So yeah, they're really important for phonemic awareness and they will help them later on when they come to spelling as well. Yeah, so it's very efficient in terms of working on the phonemic awareness. There's not a separate phonemic awareness exercise here. It's tied right into being able to write what they hear. Yeah. And so they have to listen. They have to become aware of whatever sound um, is being focused on, and then they have to write it. Now, when yeah. you say name, the name of the letter is a sound. Let's yeah. be clear yeah. about that, right? And then we did this, but when I did my, when we was doing our research all the time, when I explained to them, it has a long sound and it has a short sound. Well, Oh, they could think of five. You could see them really thinking, long. What do you mean? Long. And I said, sure, if you listen, A, A, and they'd be A, long. Well, and they'd look, look at me really daft, even older ones. I don't get what you mean. You mean it's longer? And I went, no, listen to the sound. And in the end, I just I just tried it. And I said, well, let's try it this way. And I just said, we've got to the part in the wasp, we've done all the sounds. And I said, I just said to him, what about if I say to you, a letter has a name and it has its sound. We only do vowels, we don't do Ds or we only do the vowels. And I said to them, what if I say to you, um, E, it's its name and E, it's its sound. And most of them really clicked on. It was just really confusing them. I used to think they were the short and long. long. You, you could see they were imagining this really long lesson. And, said, <laughs> and they would write it sound. down. They could, they yeah, they make down. it longer. <laughs> you know, they start going, long. <laughs> said, no, it's the same. It's just a long sound. And they just, especially yeah. ones who, who dyslexic and having problems, they just couldn't, couldn't click it. And as soon as I did a name and it has a sound, it really just, the light bulbs lit on, so I thought, do you know what? I know most people, do, they do the um, sounds. They do the short and the yeah, long. long. And if your student can do short and long and knows what you mean when you talk about a short sound and a long sound, or then they just couldn't get it. it I I'm, I'm it trying to just clarify this. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned it, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yes, you know, you know, if we're saying, oh, we start with the sounds and sounds are important. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're using the term name. Yeah. Yes, it's the name of the letter, but we're really talking about a long vowel sound. Yeah. 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 I just yeah. want to make that clear, you yeah. know, in terms of what we're talking about. That So, Abby, the program starts with short vowel sound. sounds. Yeah. All right. And then... Um, in, in OG world, in Orton Gillingham, these would be what you would call closed syllables, yeah. right? That yeah. create a short vowel sound. Yeah. And then we move on to what would be open syllables or vowel consonant E syllables, which yeah. create a long vowel sound, which mm -hmm. they are using the term name. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So yeah, that yeah. I want to just clear yeah. that up, yeah. So, yeah. you know, and I don't mean to sound like I'm interpreting for no, you. No, 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 I'm no, trying yeah. to get into the head of a parent, yeah. getting yeah. into yeah. the head of uh, anybody watching this who yeah. might not, you know, when it's your program, it's your baby, you take for granted what people understand what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. trying to step away and say, okay, where yeah. could the confusion be? So 
uh, that's what they're describing. That when um, you see the term pro in there, um, maybe you could jump in for that. Some people would look and say, what's pro mean? You know, yeah, you know, yeah. people who don't read the directions carefully. There are a lot of those who want to just jump in and start and not want to mm -hmm. take the time to read the directions. So that would be pronouncing, right? It's yeah, yeah. pronunciation it and it's yeah. clear pronunciation. So I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. So um, let's say there's a word like uh, the word ribbon. Now we're, we're moving ahead. Let's say this is more advanced now. It's a two syllable yeah. word. The word is ribbon. Yeah. The second syllable of ribbon, you would think would be spelled I-N, right? Mm -hmm. That's a schwa sound there. Mm -hmm. When they are saying pronounce, we mean precise, um, you know, exactly the way you see the word. So like ribbon, ah, so that they could actually have a chance of spelling it correctly. We always, we always uh, so stipulate, spelling we words. always say stress all the vowel sounds because unless you stress them, your student is never going to be able to spell them. But then talk about it afterwards and say ribbon. They say, we don't really pronounce it like that. How, how do we pronounce it? And they'll say ribbon. So then you draw into attention. And I, you know, the, in, you'll notice in the book that the um, the schwa sounds are in amber, just to help them sort of, it's to try and help them see, oh, what's going on this word? Oh, that's making the schwa sound. And once the student spelled the word, I always ask them and say, can you underline the schwa sound in that? And they'll say, ribbon. oh, and the, so you, because we're really wanting to draw their attention to not all vowels stress the sound. Yeah. And once they understand that, you know, that's a massive thing. It's the icing on the cake to reading is being able yeah. to learn because that unstressed Because language. that's the only hardest part in ribbon. Yes. Yeah. It's the unstressed sound. They can build it. But obviously, it's hard is the, is the unstressed sound because all, all vowels are unstressed. That's a difficult part. So it's not about... I have a lot of students that, you know, they, they don't build. They just to spell it. It's S-P-R, like you've said. And in, in the word, all it is is... You build, you build the rest. Let's look at what's tricky in this word. Like parchment, the only tricky part is the unstressed. The mint. The mint. mint. So you've just got to remember to use an F there. Mm -hmm. So that's all about, that's what the colour coding is there for. You know, when people say what's all that, it's, it's trying to visually show them what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, look, the vowel sounds are in green, the vowel names are in red. We've got amber now that's showing when you, that, that, and the schwa doesn't come in in the on it till later on. We're now going to show you what that's that's making the uh sound. So when I'm doing reading exercises, my students will go patch, and then we say, you know, because we want them, because there's no good if they go through live reading patch meant, because then when it comes to spelling, somebody will say to them parchment and they'll be going, mint, 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 mm -hmm. what's the mint? So they're getting used to all the time now when I hear that, uh, oh, that's yeah. a schwa. It's not going to help them remember which vowel to use, but they know it's got a schwa sound in there. And I would say, try and use your robot voice. You know, like, let's look at that. We're going to go parchment or dragon. And they're going, oh, so you don't, don't sound like dragon, but let's use our spelling voice. And then we'll say it back again. So it's really just getting them to help and them to take notice of this schwa sound. And, you know, a lot of parents will go, schwa sound. Well, I've never, I never no, learnt about that. It's like you've obviously picked it up incidentally without even realising that that's what a schwa in. I never knew what a schwa sound was, mm -hmm. but I could spell words with schwa sounds in. So I must have obviously, without noticing, I've picked it up. But some of our students, and particularly those with dyslexic, are not picking this up without being explicitly, this is what it is, this is what's going on. And the colour coding, that's what that's all about. It's drawing their attention to what is happening in those words. Yeah. So basically, we have our spelling voice and we have our reading voice. So when you when you ask a student to spell, you must sound every every letter out like lemon. And once they've wrote it down, they must read it. And then you say, well, so what does it say in your reading voice? And then they say lemon. Lemon. Yeah. Simple as that. Tying it together. So you have a spelling voice and a reading voice. Yeah. Right. And that's why. 
um, just quickly, that's why it doesn't matter American accent, a British accent, if you're using your perfect recording voice, that's what I call it, yeah, yeah. perfect recording voice, that the kids learn that that's the sound you use when you sound out to you know, first figure things out and to spell, you need that perfect recording voice. But in our natural language, it really doesn't matter what accent you have. Yeah. So it's, it's, it really, um, it, it should clarify for the audience, for parents, don't worry. You know, the United States is a big country. We have so many different accents here. We do, well, we yeah, do, yeah. Yeah. We do yeah. here, yeah. Right. I mean, look, New York, forget about it. You know, we, we <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. so um, I, I would never be able to spell correctly if I went by how I say things with my yeah. Brooklyn accent. So clearly I have to adjust and think about what's on the page. And we naturally do this, we tweak words. We tweak sounds, we adjust, but the kids, like you said, who struggle need to be taught this explicitly. That's the difference. And yeah. any good program addresses schwa. They yeah. do. Um, look, in the Wilson program, I, you know, I was trained in that. I'm certified in Wilson. The joke was schwa happens. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's say I'm working with my child. It's going very well. We're, we're uh, progressing. What else can, what else can I do to help my child improve their reading and spelling skills? Just lots and lots. I mean, I know it's your favorite word, is it practice? You've yeah. just got to practice as much as possible. And it doesn't always mean you sat at the table. I've, you know, said to some of my parents, do it in the car while you're in the car. Let's talk about words. Let's talk about the sounds and just try and get in as much as possible. You know, talking about maybe you've learned the pattern in the book. Let's talk about it afterwards. And oh, what? Why is that spelled that? And you'd want to show it. Oh, because it's a vowel sound and it, it's it's not all about sitting and doing the book. This is going to give you the skills to help yeah. there. But there's just, lots of just practice. about shopping and you see a word. Yeah, and you just say. Could you pick the stress letter in that? Yeah. It's just all the all the time, just drip feeding, little clues to them all the time. The decodable books are brilliant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't recommend them enough. They are what they are. They're designed for that practice basis. I know lots of people argue, oh, you don't get enough comprehension skills from that book. That's not what they're designed for. They're designed to put the practice in. If, if you want your child to progress with you know, comprehension, then there's nothing to stop you reading books to them to help them progress that. But we're all about decoding and encoding. And that stage, we need the decodable books. And they're brilliant for that because it's just putting it all into practice. It's not giving them anything that's going to overwhelm them or even getting them to write silly sentences. Don't give them words that you've not approached yet because what's the point? You're giving them stuff that you know that they can do. You've given them the skills to do it. Now we're going to put loads of practice in. Yeah. And as, as I said, this book pulls all the weaknesses out. So I just keep working on the weaknesses all the time. Yeah, just asking them questions, like lots lot, so or giving them spellings or a dictation. Just all the, all the time, just often and little. Yeah. As possible. Which decodable books align well with your program? Well, I like uh, the phonics phonics books I know that they do them through high moon over there don't they now so I love that she's got especially I love them for older readers yep. I've got you know students at 12 and I went into school last week and you know I've got well what is it he's 10 is he and he's sat and I still bring your book out that you're reading in class mm -hmm. and it was far above where he was supposed to be and I said to the teacher oh it, she, you know he's reading this book it's not for him and she said we don't expect him to read it it's just so he doesn't look out of place in class we've told him just to look at the pictures and my heart sunk I was mm. like that poor boy you just give him it because he don't want to have the really uh, is it a reception level so four or five age and he, if they didn't want him to sit in front of all the rest of the class when they do the half an hour reading hour with that book which I understand mm. So I'm, you know, them high noon books, the, you know, the phonics books would be brilliant for him because they don't look childish, but they're at the CVC level that he's at. So I, I think they're brilliant, those books, especially for the catch-up readers. I think they're really yes. good. 
Excellent. Yes, and well, we've had that conversation too, right, Marion? About yes. um, you know, which books align well with, yep. with programs. And I know those books align with Sounds Right, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that program, which is a yeah. whole class program. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we are making all the right contacts with the right <laughs> people. No, I'm, and I'm plugging what we're doing because, Definitely. you know, it's important that we, we look at this holistically. We're trying to fill in holes for different audiences, right? And yeah. so there's that whole classroom piece that needs to be addressed. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we have that one-on-one -on -one and the TAs. So, you know, my mind is working about how we could do this with the right connection. So I'm glad you said that, that's great. Yeah, I am too. And, you know, the nice thing about phonic books, especially for older children, is that depending on where they are, there's so many varieties. They are engaging and they look like big kid books. They're relevant. They're diverse. They really do an excellent job. And so that's, this is great information to know. And uh, I know there are a few distributors in the US, but uh, High Noon is uh, also who we list as the place to go to order their books. Yeah, good, good, that's good. So uh, it, is there anything else that anybody wants to add before we uh, before we end this video? Um, no, I mean, so. we're always available out via email. And yeah. um, if anybody's got any questions, we could do Zoom meetings, individual parents. If anybody's got any questions where they just think, I'm really not getting this and I'm struggling. We, no question is silly because if you're thinking it, then somebody else is obviously thinking it as well. And, like you say, you put all your years of coaching into this book, but there's always going to be something that somebody doesn't get. And we're quite happy to answer questions or, you know, help yeah. them work through sections. We find the best way is that you do a quick video. Well, yeah, if they want, it's like I say, like Zoom's brilliant nowadays. So if they just wanted to meet, you know, have a chat on Zoom and we can talk through the page on the book and bring pages up on the screen and sort of show them. So then that's fine. We're happy what about research? on your program, do you have well, anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we did, 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 I mean, eight years in the school, we trialed our book, so we've got, we are on the what yeah, works. Greg, yeah, Greg Brooks, um, I don't know if you've heard of Greg Brooks, he puts together, mm -hmm. it was like every few years, he was commissioned by, um, I can't remember the organization, it might be what some, some big dyslexia program. He was commissioned to put together a like a document called What Works for those who are struggling with literacy. So you have to provide all your evidence um, and, your and, research. Then, and all the research and you get listed in there. So we've been listed in the last two editions of that as well. Well, this is great information. I hope that uh, people watching have the confidence to uh, start working with the Hornet Literacy Primer. Thank you. Thank you.